Thanks you. Thank you, Josh and Jonah and Evan for leading us in worship. Good morning, church family. Let me add my word of welcome to all of you, especially any first-time guests. We're glad that you're here. And uh, also anybody joining online, there's the camera. Uh, we're glad that you've uh, tuned in to watch and to participate. Uh, as the president of Gateway, I also want to just say a word of thanks because it's through your support of this church and through this church, the cooperative program, that Gateway Seminary is able to shape the next generation of leaders to expand God's kingdom around the world. So I just want you to know that through your faithful support of Pathway, you're making a bigger impact around the world than you even know. Although that was really encouraging to watch that video. So thanks, Josue, for putting that together. I hope your heart is full. Well, this morning we're going to continue, actually conclude, our sermon series in the psalm titled, Recapturing the Wonder. I want to invite you to turn in your Bible to Psalm 13. Um, turn in your Bible to Psalm 13. If you're using one of these sort of Bibles that the church provides, it's on page 257. Otherwise, the verses will be on the screen when we read in a moment. And the, the, the wonder that we're recapturing this morning is the wonder that God moves us from despair to joy. The wonder is that you're not stuck in a state of despair. You don't have to live your life every day, day after day, feeling despair. So that's the wonder. As I read, maybe you'll spot that. So let me read and then I'll pray for us and we'll get into God's word together. Psalm 13, to the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let's pray together. God, we pray that you would be glorified as we look to your word. I ask God, that your spirit would be at work in our hearts. I pray that you would empower me to be accurate and, Lord, to cut it straight. I also pray, Lord, that your spirit would be active in our hearts to move us from despair to joy. God, there are many who are hurting and grieving. We pray for the Jarbo family, the Adams family, Lord, and the passing of Tammy's father. Pray, Lord, that you would comfort those who are uh, who are grieving this morning with the hope of the resurrection. God, we devote this time to you. We devote ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's an obscure, little-known Broadway musical that came out a few years ago called Hamilton. <laughs> oh, you guys have heard of this? Okay, good, good. We're off to a good start. Well, maybe some of you, like us in our family, not only know the soundtrack, but pretty much have every line memorized. Well, in the, in, the, in the musical, there's a song called Right Hand Man. And the song introduces us to General George Washington. And it's sort of this big moment in the, one of the opening ensemble songs where Washington comes out on stage and everybody loves Washington. He's a big figure, political leader, influential guy, but then there's this point in the song where Washington sort of breaks the fourth wall, looks out to the audience, the ensemble freezes, and Washington says, can I be real a second for just a millisecond? Let down my guard and tell the people how I feel a second. And it's powerful because this person of influence and stature and power reveals that inside there is doubt and anxiety and despair. Well, in Psalm 13, David is doing something very similar. A person of influence, a person 
of leadership, a person of political power, is sort of opening up the curtain and getting real and revealing what we might call a crisis of faith. But I don't want you to think this psalm, which is a song, you notice that in the introduction it's written to the choir master, so that's what it's for, and it's a psalm of David, that's who it's by. I don't want you to think that in modern terms this is like a downer song. I don't know what you think of as a downer song, an emo song, like a really sad sit on the porch and cry country song. It's more like an anthem of faith that's designed to move us, to rally us, to rally our faith. It, it starts with feelings of despair in verses 1 and 2, but then it moves to hope in verses 3 and 4, and then finally to joy in verses 4 and 5. So you could say it starts out as a blues song, but then the radio dial turns, and it ends up as a gospel song. So let's look at these three parts together and see from God what is the path to joy. So uh, as I say, first in verses 1 through 2, we see feelings of despair. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul? and have sorrow in my heart all day, how long shall my enemies be exalted over me? You notice that every sentence begins the same way with a question. What's the question? How long? These are two words that speak to feelings of despair to which we can all relate. Feelings that God has forgotten you, verse 1. Feelings that God has abandoned you, verse 1. Feeling that you're alone, verse 2. Feeling like everything bad is sort of winning in your life. And we see that David appears to be stuck in these feelings of despair, kind of like a record skipping. If you've got a record player, every once in a while that happens. A record is just stuck, and David's stuck. How long? How long? How long? Straight away, this psalm is powerful in helping to show us two things. First, we can be honest with God about our feelings. And second, that while our emotions matter to God, feelings and reality are not always the same thing. And that should not come as a surprise because we live in a fallen world and we are sinners. And since we're fallen and since Sin affects everything, including our emotions. The reality of the world is not always or often how we feel. If you're on a plane and it's going through turbulence, you might be sitting in your seat in the back of the plane, sort of white-knuckling it, gripping to the armrest. I don't know what that would do, but you're gripping, gripping to those armrest handles. And meanwhile, the, cock, the pilot in the cockpit is looking at his controls, and all systems are fine. The weather breaks just ahead. No real problems. And so up front, he's in control, but in back, you are freaking out because your feelings are not painting an accurate picture of reality. So in Psalm 13, the reality is, the reality is that God has not forgotten David. God has not abandoned David. God is exalted and victorious over sin and death. God is working all things to good. He, God is not losing, and he, God has not lost control no matter how David feels. And so moving from despair to joy requires acknowledging at the very least that while my feelings are real, what God has said in his word is real regardless of how I might feel in the moment. And so this is important because moving from despair to joy requires acknowledging this because we, like David, often feel stuck and we can relate. And there's a lot of reasons why David might be feeling this way. If you read 2 Samuel and you read the story of David, 
David has gone through just about whatever, what, anything that a person can go through. David knows the valleys of darkness of sin and the loss of family. He knows betrayal. He knows the torment of personal failure and self-destructive anger. All of that is there in the life of David, just as all of that is there in my life, and all of that is there in your life. So this psalm is even more relatable because while we know that David is experiencing feelings of despair, we don't know why. We know, that feel, feel, we know what it feels like to despair, to feel alone, to feel abandoned, to feel forgotten. David's experience is not uncommon, it's not rare, it's not really even special. Because every Christian in this room can identify with these words. You've all had the question of the heart, how long, God? You know the feeling that there is no comfort, the feeling of despair. But the hope of this, the hope of this psalm is that God is not far off and God can move us from despair to joy. God sees us in our despair, he loves us in our despair, but he doesn't want us stuck. God wants to move us to joy. There's a painting by Raphael called The School of Athens. You might have seen it. It's this wonderful painting that features all of these philosophers. But the moment you look at the painting, your eye is is sort of trained by the painter. It's, It's intended by the painting to sort of move your gaze to the center where Plato and Aristotle are talking. And in the same way, this psalm is moving our attention away from our feelings of despair to the possibility of hope and joy in God. So in verses 3 and 4, we see, we see the song begin to change from a, gospel, from a blues song to a gospel song as we see hope in God. Hope in God, verses 3 and 4. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light my eyes, lest I should sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I've prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Spurgeon says that if verses 1 and 2 are a cry, verses 3 and 4 are a prayer. It's a little bit of light shining in the darkness. It's like the clouds are parting and there's a a ray of light that's broken through. The dark clouds of verses 1 and 2 are giving way to the light of verses 3 and 4. And the light, the hope, the wonder is that there is hope in God. God is the source of light in the darkness of despair. Notice that in the cry of verses 1 and 2, David refers to God. You see that? In verses one, he just refers to, oh, oh Lord, oh, 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 how long, oh Lord? It's just sort of general. But then in verse, thir- in verse three, there's a transition. Consider and answer me, oh Lord, my God. And so there's this subtle shift to the hope, the hope that there is in God through a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so what is it that a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ does? Exactly how does that give us hope? Well, you can see what David says. God can light up your eyes. God can rescue you from death. God can deliver you from your enemies. God is in control. I want you to understand this is not like the power of positive thinking. This is not Pollyannish sort of wishfulness. This is hope grounded in reality. Like a person who's going down some stairs and begins to lose their footing and reaches out to grab onto a solid banister, David is falling and he, and he sort of reaches out and takes hold of God. He grabs onto something real, something solid, something firm, something that gives real hope. The danger, or I should say kind of the warning here, is that when you are facing despair, things only get worse if you grab onto the wrong thing. If you look to the things of the world, 
that cannot give hope, that cannot save. Things will only get worse and you will not get lasting joy. We've all been there. We've all been there despairing and down and making the mistake of looking to things that provide sort of momentary happiness, but no lasting joy, no sure footing for the soul. So David shows us that in doubt, in despair, there is not only hope, but there is only hope in God through a personal relationship with God, through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is important because David in, verse, in verses 3 and 4 is sort of revealing that there are all of these fears in his life. And oftentimes when you find yourself in a state of despair, it's because you're sort of drowning in fear. You're kind of living in the world of what if? What if I lose my job? What if the tests come back negative? What if my child never turns back to the Lord? What if? You find yourself sort of in a quicksand state of the soul. But David, David sort of lets us in on this, and he shows that the hope in God is not in what might happen, but whatever happens, God is in control. And so he does what the Bible tells us to do. He sort of takes his cares to the Lord. He says, Lord, these are my fears. This is the state of my despair. I'm hoping in you, God, because I know that you can light my eyes. I know that you can deliver me. I know that you can save me. But he's being honest with God, and he's saying, God, these are all of the fears that are sort of weighing down my soul. And hoping in God and looking to God and remembering who God is and what, what God can do is the only way to move from despair to hope but then ultimately to joy. So we see in verses 5 and 6 the path to joy. Verses 5 and 6 say, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully. So if verses 1 and 2 are a cry, and if verses 3 and 4 are a prayer, then verses 5 and 6 are a song of joy. Change is possible. This is the wonder of this passage. You're not stuck. God doesn't want to leave us in despair. God wants to move us to joy. And the possibility of heartfelt joy, look in verse 5. Notice David says, my heart shall rejoice. This is not fake it till you make it. This is not, I'm coming to church, look happy. David is saying that when you are in a state of despair, you can be honest with God, you can look to God, there is hope in God, and God will sort of, sort of cause the record player to get to the next line, and he will move you from despair to hope and ultimately to joy. And so this passage sort of does the work of application for us, there are three steps on the path to joy. Remember, resolve, and rejoice. It's easy. Remember, resolve, and rejoice. And here's the good news of this path to joy, is that the possibility is not only real, but it's, it's closer than you think. You know, Satan wants us to think that we're, we're, we're sort, of, sort of sinking in the quicksand of despair, but it'll take years to get to a place of heartfelt joy. And David says, no, it won't. I might even say, based upon the authority of this passage, I don't know how you came in this morning, but I know how you can leave. And the way you get to a place of heartfelt joy isn't about circumstances changing, although some things may need to change in your life. It's about the movement of the heart towards a posture of hope and joy in the Lord. So remember, resolve, and rejoice. First, remember. Notice what David says in verse 5. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. David remembers that he's trusted. This is one of the reasons that it is so good for us to share our testimonies. You invite somebody over to your house. It's a great thing to say, tell me how you came to faith in the Lord. Kind of like asking someone, how did you meet your spouse? You're sort of inviting them to remember the, the beginning of the story of their love. 
And David is saying, for all that's wrong, I do know this. I do know that I've trusted in God. I know that I've trusted in his steadfast love, his covenant faithfulness. I know that God has made promises. I know he keeps those promises. And I'm going to move from a state of despair to a place of joy. And that requires us to remember David remembers that God has dealt bountifully with him. Look at verse 6. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is so important because for whatever is wrong in your life, you can always, always, always remember your salvation. And you can always look back and trace the hand of God's faithfulness and goodness in your life. God has been merciful to you. He has dealt bountifully with you. He has saved you from so much evil, from so much suffering. Whatever you face, God has spared us from so much worse. So David remembers, and it's not that he has amnesia. It's not like he has some condition. David is choosing to put the reality of God's faithfulness at the forefront of his thinking. David is making a conscious choice. God, I'm not going to focus on my feelings of despair. They don't paint an accurate picture of reality. I am going to choose to focus on your work in my life. I'm going to choose to focus on your covenant love. I'm going to choose to focus on your bountiful goodness towards me. David, we could say, is done listening to himself. Now he's preaching to himself. Might I suggest to you that that's a good thing to do. But this is more than a pep talk because he moves from remembering the second step on the path to joy is resolve, resolve. Notice in verse five, my heart shall rejoice. My heart shall rejoice. Verse six, I will sing to the Lord. And look, maybe you like me sometimes come to church and you can't even make it through the first song without just starting to cry. Maybe it's in the, world, in the words of Leonard Cohen, a broken hallelujah. But God invites us to rejoice and to sing. And David says, David says, I'm resolved to rejoice. I'm resolved to sing. I will sing to the Lord. My heart shall rejoice. David remembers his faith in God. He remembers God's gracious character and resolves to rejoice and sing to the Lord. In verses 1 and 2, David's feelings were in the driver's seat, but now the hands of faith have taken control of the steering wheel. Remember, resolve, and rejoice. Step number three. Action is required. Faith must be in the driver's seat. Feelings will follow. I will sing to the Lord. I will rejoice. God's love is steadfast and he has dealt bountifully with me no matter how bad things are, no matter how I feel. Jesus Christ has come to save us. He has died to redeem us. He rose from the dead, defeating sin and death. Even right now, even right now, as you're white knuckling it back in the turbulence of life, Jesus Christ is in full control over all of the affairs of your life. The things that are known and the things that are to you unknown by anyone else. These things are true. These things give us hope. David is inviting us that these things should direct our feelings and move us from despair to joy. So that's the path from despair to joy. So let me be very clear based on this psalm. We are not helpless. We We don't need to feel stuck. God has given us in Christ his word and all of the hope you need for your joy to be restored. You might want to jot down 2 Peter 1, 3. 2 Peter 1, 3, you can look this up later today. But Peter says that God's divine power has granted us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And when you read that verse, I'd recommend you you highlight or circle the words, all things. 
all that you need to become unstuck, all that you need to move from despair to joy, all that you need to take action, all that you need to sort of enlarge your heart and be revived is granted by God through his spirit in his church and through his word. And you have been given by God all that you need. So we need not feel stuck. We can remember, we can resolve, we can rejoice. John Bunyan wrote a book called Pilgrim's Progress, classic Christian book. And in the book, he tells the story of Christian on his journey to the celestial city. And that's like us. We're on a journey towards heaven, the heavenly city. In the book Pilgrim's Progress, the character of Christian is constantly distracted. There are all of these temptations. And at one point, he finds himself stuck in a place called Doubting Castle, that's guarded by the giant of despair. But at some point in the, in the doubting castle, he reaches into his pocket and he finds the key called promise, which opens up all the doors of doubting castle. And he goes from being imprisoned to being free. And then he says this, what a fool I am thus to lie in a stinking dungeon when I may as well walk at liberty I have a key in my bosom called promise that will, I am persuaded, open any lock in Doubting Castle. And so those words resonate with us. We don't want to be foolish. You don't need to spend another day imprisoned in Doubting Castle, stuck in the quicksands of despair. You can move from the blues to the gospel. You can move from despair to hope and to joy. That's the wonder of the psalm. How do you do that? You can look to Jesus, who holds all of the keys of promise, in whom all of God, in, in whom all of God's promises are yes and amen. And I'm going to pray in a moment, and we're going to sing, and then people will be up front. And let me just urge you, don't leave in a state of despair. Trust in Jesus, maybe for the first time. Pray and ask him to save you from your sin, to rescue you from despair. Maybe you've tried everything else. And I want to encourage you that while those things let you down, inevitably they let you down, they will always let you down. If you grab hold of Jesus, he will actually rescue from sin and death and despair. He will actually save you. He can actually grant you lasting, heartfelt, eternal joy. And he'll never abandon you. But if you're a believer and you're here this morning experiencing despair, and I know, I know that that's true, I want to encourage you, don't leave in a state of despair. Don't just sort of exist in the private quicksand of despair. At the end of our service, there are people that stand up here and will pray with you. And that is not just like some performative religious act. We actually want to pray for you. And so there's no need to be embarrassed because we've all been there. David has been there. I've been there. You've been there. And so I just want to urge you, don't just walk out despairing. Walk forward and just grab somebody's hand and say, I trust in Jesus, but I'm despairing. Would you pray for me? And they will. And just I encourage you to see what corporate prayer will do for your life and for your journey from despair to hope and even even today, to joy.